Well into the second decade of the 21st century, the effects of climate change are being felt across the world. Economic activity and population growth have resulted in unprecedented concentrations of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere and led to a warming of the Earth's temperature. Sea level is rising, oceans' acidity is increasing, and the changing climate is affecting natural and human systems on all continents. In 2009, Indonesia became the first developing country to announce a cut of greenhouse gas emissions. The biggest archipelago of the world realized its vulnerability to climate change and committed to reduce emissions by 26% by 2020, or 41% with international support. With almost 250 million people, Indonesia is the world's fourth most populous nation and one of the world's largest emitters of greenhouse gases. Converting the 16th largest economy of the world to clean technologies will be no easy task. Emissions are expected to increase further due to a growing population and an expanding economy highly dependent on fossil fuels. Its industry, transport, housing and commerce sectors will require profound changes to become energy efficient. Since 2009, many policies, action plans and commitments have been made. But how much is the government of Indonesia really spending on climate change mitigation? Is the money being spent in activities that can achieve the country's ambitious emissions reduction targets? For that purpose, the Indonesian Finance Ministry launched a budget tagging system to track financial flows to activities that mitigate climate change with the support of UNDP and UNEP. The Ministry of Finance aims at understanding whether activities that are currently being funded can achieve the emissions reduction targets. The system will put a tag and later will rate activities based on their contribution to reduce emissions. It is a way to identify how much budget has been allocated and how it has been spent, whether it contributed to reach the country's emission reduction target through development of financial incentives to produce policies or for practical activities like reforestation, renewable energy, eco-efficient transportation, energy-efficient buildings, waste to energy, or restoration of degraded land. Indonesia is the first country of the world to have adopted such a tracking system. Seven ministries are legally required to put it in place by 2015. Nah, budget tagging bisa membantu pemerintah di dalam mengontrol uh, perencanaan yang dilakukan oleh KL dan pembiayaan yang diberikan oleh pemerintah di dalam melaksanakan aktivitas tersebut sehingga bisa pada akhirnya bisa membandingkan antara perencanaan dan implementasi serta output yang dicapai dari masing-masing kegiatan tersebut terkait dengan penem misalnya dalam hal ini adalah e, berapa besar dengan mengeluarkan budget sekian berapa besar emisi yang akan diturunkan agar setiap alokasi anggaran terhadap kegiatan apapun juga termasuk misalnya kegiatan yang mendukung mitigasi ataupun adaptasi itu sudah ditandai dengan sebuah kode tertentu apakah dilaksanakan atau tidak itu juga dapat diketahui dengan kode-kode yang ada di dalam kode program dan kegiatan. Ini salah satu contoh bagaimana alokasi anggaran untuk tahun anggaran 2015 terkait perubahan iklim, kontribusi APBN secara nasional itu sebesar 45,3 triliun. Nah, angka 45,3 triliun ini kita dapatkan melalui budget tagging. Jadi aspek transparansi, tra aspek akuntabilitas, itu dapat dikawal oleh masyarakat selaku stakeholder. Saya pikir dengan menerapkan satu budget tagging itu akan membantu pemerintah untuk lebih mengefisienkan budgetnya sehingga hanya kegiatan-kegiatan yang akan yang cost efektif yang akan dibiayai. Spending the government's budget wisely and setting up the right incentives and disincentives is expected to encourage investors in technologies that reduce greenhouse gas emissions. Investors like Mr. Muhammad Bedoui and Mr. Douglas Manarung. Mr. Muhammad Bedoui's office is overcrowded with national and international trophies, rewarding his pioneering entrepreneurial career. He proudly explains how he struggled to get his business started when he was only 27 
and nobody believed in him. Today, he manages a plastic recycling network that operates from Papua New Guinea to Sumatra. He has supported entrepreneurs all over Indonesia to establish plastic recycling depots and equip them with his personally designed plastic grinding machine. He buys all their plastic pellets production and sells it to China. Kegiatan ini berawal dari pemulung. Jadi nanti pemulung itu akan mengambil barang dia keliling dari rumah ke rumah, dari tempat-tempat sampah. Kemudian pemulung ini akan storekan barangnya untuk dijual kepada bosnya, namanya depo. Kemudian di depo inilah akan mengirimkan barang-barangnya ke pabrik seperti kami. Kami akan membayar barang tersebut dengan harga yang lebih mahal sehingga mereka mendapatkan keuntungan dari situ. Kemudian nanti di pabrik kami barulah diproses, kita pisahkan barang-barang tersebut menurut jenis dan warnanya dari plastik itu masing-masing. Itu akan bekerja ibu-ibu yang akan mengupas tutup botol dan labelnya dipisahkan sesuai jenis dan warnanya masing-masing. Kemudian dimasukkan ke dalam mesin penggiling untuk digiling plastik tersebut. Setelah menjadi cacahan, kemudian akan dicuci, dibersihkan, lalu kemudian ada proses untuk pengeringan. Dikeringkan barangnya, kemudian nanti setelah kering dimasukkan ke dalam karung. Sebagian barang ada yang kami buat menjadi barang-barang jadi seperti sapu, tetapi sebagian lagi berupa scraps kita akan ekspor ke China. Plastic recycling reduces greenhouse gas emissions because producing new plastic from scratch would consume more energy than just recycling plastic. Mohammad started his factory with two employees. Today, he employs 50 people in Jakarta, and his plastic recycling network has created jobs for thousands of people. Dan luar biasanya lagi, banyak orang yang bisa terlibat di sini, bisa bekerja, dan itu jelas memberikan kontribusi buat masyarakat. Dari satu pabrik itu membutuhkan paling tidak 20 depo. Satu depo itu mempekerjakan paling tidak itu 15 sampai 30 pemulung. Sehingga kalau dikalikan bisa sangat banyak sekali orang-orang yang terlibat di usaha daur ulang sampah ini. Douglas Manarung is the managing director of TPST Bantar Gebang a waste treatment facility that works in Bantar Gebang, the biggest landfill of Indonesia. The company receives 6,000 tons of waste every day from Jakarta province. They sort it out, convert organic waste into organic fertilizer, and convert plastic waste into plastic pellets that can be sold. Decomposing garbage releases methane into the atmosphere and has an impact on climate change 20 times worse than carbon dioxide. Douglas's company collects and treats the methane gas released by waste to produce electricity that is sent to the grid. The plant is generating 10 megawatts of electricity, and Douglas hopes to reach 26 megawatts. Artinya kami bisa tangkap 400.000 sampai 500.000 ton ekuivalen CO2. Dan ini sudah kami lakukan lebih kurang 5 tahun lebih. Bisa kita bayangkan bagaimana banyaknya gas metan yang tadinya ini akan terbang ke udara dan kami konversi menjadi energi listrik yang bisa dimanfaatkan oleh rakyat di Indonesia. According to Douglas Manarung, the lack of financial incentives is making it difficult to maintain the business. While in countries such as the United States, the company receives from the local government around $80 for each ton of waste stored in the landfill. In Indonesia, the company only receives between seven and eight dollars. Capturing 400 to 500 tons of equivalent carbon dioxide allows selling 400 to 500 carbon credits through the clean development mechanism in the carbon market. This could have complemented their income if the value of carbon credits hadn't dropped from 14 to 0 0.30 euros a ton in the past years. While projects like Majestic Bawana Group or TPST Bantara Gabang are doing extraordinary work to reduce emissions, it is eventually the government's incentives or disincentives that will allow them to fail or flourish. It is crucial for the government to identify the type of strategic activity that can create a friendly environment for public and private investments to succeed, and the tagging and scoring system can help to do so.